Jessica Simor, QC, a barrister at Matrix uh, Chambers. Um, thanks for joining us, Jessica. Um, first of all, I suppose, full disclosure, you come from a pro-Remain perspective. But let me ask you, you know, from a legal standpoint, do you think the government has made the case persuasively at all that this is not a matter for the courts? Um, having watched quite a lot of the proceedings, not all of them, it seems to me that uh, the case that the prorogation was unlawful and justiciable um, is likely to succeed. So, uh, on balance, I think that, that uh, it's more likely that the case will succeed. <clears throat> you think it will? I mean, the divisional court in London said this, that even if the prorogation was designed to advance the government's political agenda, read the EU, it is not territory for the courts to enter with a judicial review. That's right. And, and Michael Fordham QC, speaking today for the Welsh Government, um, explained very clearly how uh, it is absolutely normal for the courts to examine the justification for a governmental act by reference to its objective consequences and to determine whether um, that there is a breach of constitutional principles or fundamental rights. And he did that by reference to cases that concern statute. Uh, but reading that across in constitutional and legal terms, uh, he made the point that there was no reason in principle why exactly the same approach shouldn't be adopted in the context of a prerogative. Right. I mean, it is a huge decision, which we expect, I think, early next week. Isn't there a likelihood, though, that Supreme Court justices may shy away from you know, coming down against the government for concern, how can I put it, you know, for where it may all lead? Well, the really delicate point that you saw at the end of the hearing when uh, remedy was being discussed is Article 9 of the Bill of Rights, which prohibits courts from interfering in the proceedings in Parliament. And gov the government was saying that prorogation, the act of prorogation, uh, constitutes a proceeding in Parliament. And so it would infringe Article 9 of the Bill of Rights for the court to make any remedy uh, that affected uh, those proceedings. And Lord Panic, although he was willing to push up against that, uh, effectively was arguing that all the, the court needed to do was to declare that the advice that had been given to the Queen was unlawful, and that declaration would necessarily have its effect because Parliament would then take over. Yeah, and I mean, if the Supreme Court does that, if it comes down effectively against Boris Johnson, won't it also then have to give some indication, Jessica, of, you know, when or in what circumstances a suspension is legal or lawful? And that drags it into all sorts of dangerous areas, doesn't it? Well, not necessarily. Courts are very adept at looking at the specific facts of the case and avoiding giving general advice for future cases. Uh, and the facts are very, um, well, they are exceptional, really, here. And you heard from Lord Garnier uh, his explanation or view uh, that effectively the Prime Minister had misled um, the public and, and the Queen as to his reasons for prorogation. So the court may stick very much to the facts as the Scottish Court of Session did. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the history, the tradition of this is that the courts don't tend to interfere with this. Isn't the conclusion that may be made is that Parliament would have to legislate to allow the or to remove the prerogative to prorogue, if you see what I mean. They, 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 they have that, the that... tools, as I think Lord Keane said today, to do that, so that they, they should do that first. Well, they may do that um, perhaps after uh, this um, uh, claimed breach uh, is dealt with. It may well be that Parliament decides to legislate in the way they did in the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, to um, re require that prorogation is subject to some kind of statutory test, effectively becomes a statutory uh, power, in which case automatically uh, one would have judicial review. And indeed, the government in this case conceded that that would be so. Isn't it all rather academic, given the Ben bill and the fact that, you know, no deal is effectively, MPs have now passed legislation that takes no deal off the table? 
No, in fact, that was another very interesting part of today's proceedings because a lot of the proceedings were concerned with advocates explaining the consequences of Parliament being closed. And one of those consequences is that statutory instruments, which have to go through very quickly under the Withdrawal Act, under uh, so-called Henry VIII powers, are not going to get any parliamentary scrutiny at all. Uh, so would be passed without any democratic mandate effectively. Uh, that was a point that was, was made. Um, and also, it can't really be said that the Ben Act prevents no deal. Uh, and the further point must be made that closing Parliament, and was made, closing Parliament actually prevents questions to ministers, committees, uh, sitting and scrutinising the negotiations, etc., and all those other uh, actions that are taking place, apart from things that don't concern Brexit at all, which themselves are, of course, important. Yeah, just finally, I mean, um, isn't it the last throw of the dice from the Remain side, really? No, this is not really... Um, a, a remain case. This is a case, in fact, many, there, there were eight, 78 uh, MPs who brought the case in Scotland, um, which succeeded. Uh, this is a case about Parliament being able to scrutinise uh, the government, which must be accountable to Parliament. So it's a case about the representatives of the people, MPs, the elected representatives, being able effectively to represent their constituents and the interests of the country as against the desires of the executive. Okay, Jessica Simon, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.